Aloha. Part of developing a business strategy, and particularly a, a business strategy related to how you're going to use information technology, involves a, a properly understanding your competitive environment. Or the, and part of that is understanding the industry in which your business com competes in. One very popular framework for understanding your competitive environment is what's called Porter's Five Forces of Industry Structure. Now, before we look at this model, this framework, it's important to point out that this is a model for looking at the overall industry in which your firm might compete. This is not necessarily a model for understanding how you compete within your industry. Okay, I'll revisit that uh, as we uh, progress through this model. According to Michael Porter, there are five forces uh, of structure to look at in an industry. And the basic idea, once again, Porter is the one who came up with the, the, this concept of sustained competitive advantage being financial performance that is above the average for your industry peers. Okay, so within an industry, we look at the profitability of the average returns going on in this industry and try to identify, well, what impacts the average financial returns for a business in a given industry? Okay. And Porter identifies five forces that each of them that are basically competing for profits. Okay. If these forces are strong, then they will take profits away from industry participants. So for example, the, these are rivalry among competitors, threat of new entrants, threat of substitutions, bargaining power of suppliers, and bargaining power of buyers. Okay. Rivalry among competitors involves the rivalry among firms that are currently in this marketplace. Okay. So if I sell toothpaste, then my rivals are all the other companies within this market segment, within this industry, that also sell toothpaste. Okay. We're rivals because we're existing businesses offering the same or very similar products or services. Okay. Now, what happens here? If you have powerful rivals within an industry, then they're constantly going to be spending money on advertising and innovation to compete against their rivals. So Coke and Pepsi, right? These are really strong rivals. And they're going to keep pouring millions of dollars into advertising and innovating and trying to come up with new products or new angles or new uses for, for their soft drinks so that they can beat their rival. Okay? And what we end up with in a marketplace in an industry with a very strong, a handful of strong competitive rivals is we've got a pretty crowded space here. And that means that the profitability, the margins in this industry are probably not going to be very high. Now, I haven't looked at the software industry from a financial perspective, but if you look, you're likely going to find that the margins on software are probably not all that great, okay? Because we have some established vendors and they, they compete very heavily. And their, their product is viewed, at least by many of their customers, as a commodity good. It's hard to differentiate Coke from Pepsi. And if you're a loyalist between Coke or Pepsi, you may have a different opinion. But in general, it, caffeinated soft drinks, uh, it's Coke or it's Pepsi. Okay, so that's rivalry among competitors. See how many there are, see how big and powerful they are, what type of investments they're making into this space. Because those investments among rivals is going to push down the profitability the returns you can get in the industry. Okay. Now, threat of new entrants. This is other companies. How easy is it for other companies if they see you're making really good profits in your industry, what's going to prevent them from coming in? All right. So some businesses, a lot of this is based on infrastructure cost. Some businesses don't require a lot of infrastructure. I might rent a stall at the um, swap meet down at the Aloha Stadium. All right, 
And, you know, that doesn't cost much. And anyone who wants to and has a little bit of money can go rent a stall at the swap meet. So what do you see down there? You see a lot of new entrants or lots of people coming in selling roughly the same thing because it doesn't cost much to do that. Okay. So you compare that with, say, a company that manufactures computer chips okay, or hard drives. Now, the manufacture of high-performance electronic equipment requires lots of specialized knowledge, buildings, machinery, resources, access to resources, raw materials, and so forth, it costs a lot of money to get started in this space. Okay. Whereas if I go out and say buy a bunch of Aloha shirts from a wholesaler, I rent a booth in front of Foodland or at the swap meet, that's you know low startup cost. Right? Buy from one person, take it somewhere else, get started. Right? Hot dog stands relatively low overhead, low skilled job, right? Um, if I'm going into the space for developing batteries for cell phones, right? That's going to require a lot more uh, significant investment to get started in. So there, that, that impacts my threat of new entrants, right? So now we've looked at rivalry among existing competitors and what's the threat of new entrants? What's keeping other firms from coming into this industry if they see a lot of money being made here. Okay. Now we have the threat of substitutions on the bottom of this graph. A substitute is a product or service that does the same job as the product or service of the industry you're looking at. Okay. So this one is probably of the five forces. The threat of substitutions is the hardest one for students who are new to this framework to really get a handle on, and here's why. Substitute products are not those products provided by rivals. All right. So if I'm looking at Crest toothpaste, then sometimes a student will say, well, Colgate toothpaste is a substitute. No, it's not, because remember, the five forces model is designed to help you analyze the returns on investment the profits within a given industry. Okay, this is not an individual business analysis model. We're looking at the industry that we're trying to compete in and evaluate using these forces the profitability of this industry. Okay, so in this case, we look at airplanes. Now, unless you live on an island, which we do, there are substitute services available that compete with airplane flight. Okay. For example, you could drive. Driving, taking the train, are substitute products for air travel, and particularly for commuters. Okay. You may have business professionals who work in one city that's maybe an hour and a half flight away. They may fly in and they may fly back out after two or three days on the job doing some sort of consulting or whatever. In these cases, driving is perhaps less convenient, but in about the same price range in terms of cost, with the exception of time. If it start, if airline prices start getting too high, then more business travelers may opt to drive or take the commuter train. Okay. So those are substitute products or services. Do you take the bus? Do you drive to work? Those are two different products or services. They compete against each other, but not in the same sense that rivals do. Another example, uh, probably about 10 or 15 years ago, some researchers were looking at the job that milkshakes perform for businesses. And they, they looked at this and they said that milkshakes have kind of two industries that they compete in. One is the commuter industry. Right. People are on their way to work, they stop off at McDonald's and pick up a nice thick milkshake because it gives them something to sip on slowly while they're sitting in traffic. Okay. Now for many people, particularly those who are not um, members of the LDS Church, today we're seeing the rise of coffee products as a substitute for milkshakes because increasingly commuters like to sip on either a hot or a cold coffee drink uh, to keep them busy, occupied, 
keep them from falling asleep during their commute. Okay. So now coffee has become a substitute for milkshakes. Okay. So these are the threat of substitutes. Substitutes are hard to identify in an industry because they start developing and they can become quite disruptive over time. Okay. But they're not the same as existing rivals. And they're not the same as new entrants. It's a different product or service outside of the product or service of the industry we're focusing on. Okay, so that's kind of the rivalry among competitors, threat of new entrants, or you're trying to keep out new rivals, and you're trying to uh, see how easy would it be, how available are other substitutes. Do they currently exist, and maybe they're just priced out of range, or would they have to be developed independently and then come into the marketplace? Okay. Now, that brings us to bargaining power. Bargaining power goes this way across the framework. Over here we have bargaining power of suppliers. I look at the industry and I say, who's providing the inputs for this industry? All right. If I'm looking at the airline industry, who's making the airplanes? And how powerful are these suppliers? The power of the suppliers is um, influenced by the number of suppliers as well as the availability or the ease in which uh, a member of the industry can find other suppliers. So with airplanes, right, there's two primary airplane manufacturers. There's Boeing and there's Airbus. Okay. If I don't like what Boeing is offering, I can go to Airbus. If I don't like what Airbus is offering, I can go to Boeing. But if I don't like what either of them is offering, I'm really kind of stuck. So what can I do? Not much. Okay. If I go to Boeing and I say, I need a really customized airplane, they say, well, that's going to cost you a lot more. I say, well, maybe I'll get a better deal from Airbus. Probably not likely. There's, okay. So once again, if I have powerful buyers or powerful suppliers, then my bargaining power for either a lower price or customization on my product is lower. If I want anything customized, it's going to cost me. That's going to bring my profits down. Okay. On the other side, I look at my customers. Okay. If I have large, powerful customers that make up a large percentage of my business, they can negotiate with me on price. And now my profits are going to go down, or the profits in the industry as a whole go down. Okay. So that's bargaining power. We're looking at how many suppliers there are and how powerful they are in this relationship with the firms in this industry. We're looking at the buyers. How many buyers are there? and how powerful are they? Now, where does technology fit in here? In markets where commodity products are sold, that's products that are hard to differentiate from each other, okay? the internet can increase buyer power because it increases price transparency. They can see how much the goods cost within the marketplace. Okay, and they gain access to additional suppliers. Right? So, in for example, you may have rural markets. Farmers grow their crop. They may not have the means to travel to the city to see what those goods are worth. So an intermediary, a wholesaler, a distributor comes to the village and buys their product. Okay? and tells them it's worth this much. Now, it may actually be worth and likely is worth more than the distributor is willing to pay, but because the price is not transparent, they can't see how much it's worth on the open marketplace, then they'll accept a lower price. Okay, so this, this is an issue of price transparency. The internet makes the prices across the marketplace a lot more transparent. Okay, so as a buyer, if I'm looking for something and someone says, well, it costs this much, well, now I have a list of other vendors who are willing to sell me something online. You may be a student and go into the BYU Hawaii bookstore and they may say, this textbook costs this much. You say, well, on Amazon it costs this much. On Barnes & Noble it costs this much. On Craigslist I can get it for this. On Facebook I can get it for this. Now I have access to more suppliers. Okay. And in commodity markets, the internet 
uh, can increase buyer power. In markets that are differentiated, the internet can shift bargaining power to sellers because now looking the other way, I as a seller have access to more buyers than just maybe the only buyers in town. And that's a better fit for the agricultural analogy that I just shared. Okay, so um, in these markets, the internet can change the bargaining power of buyers and the bargaining power of sellers depending on the nature of the industry. Technology can increase or decrease the barriers to entry based on what type of technological infrastructure we need. Right? Now we're going to look at trends that will lower these barriers. We're also going to look at trends that will raise these barriers. Technology can also enable the development of substitute products or services that can also decrease the profitability in my industry or allow uh, the providers of these substitutes to come in, gain a head start and innovate and um, gain new profits in the marketplace. So these five forces of industry structure, rivalry among competitors, the threat of new entrants, the threat of substitutions, bargaining power of suppliers and bargaining power of buyers. These can all be uh, influential in changing the balance of profit within the industry and these all can be influenced by technological innovations. One last point about this. Performing a five forces analysis on an industry is something that has to be ongoing. These forces are not static. That means they don't stay the same. They will change over time based on what's happening in the industry and what's happening with technology uh, as it relates to the industry.